John chapter 7. Please turn your Bible there, John chapter 7. Uh, can you hear me up there okay, young man? Thank you, appreciate that. John chapter 7. We're going to start at the beginning of the chapter. And um, new chapter, new teachings from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I was reminded uh, last week we were down in Fort Smith, Arkansas and reminded of the words that the esteemed quote-unquote conservative professor of Bible studies at Dallas Theological Seminary said, uh, what was his name, Daniel, huh? Huh? Daniel Wallace, yeah, and that he said that while our red letter edition Bibles may give us great comfort in believing that the words that we're reading are the actual very words of Jesus Christ, the chances are that they're not really the words of Jesus Christ. And he said that whenever someone's writing down from memory the words that someone said, they almost always get it wrong. Well, here's where he's stupid. Here's where he's gone stupid, okay? Flat off the edge, stupid. He didn't read the rest of the Bible where it said, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Um, Kurt Aland, who was part of the uh, Greek New Testament committee back in the 80s that compiled the Novum Testamentum Gratium, the New Testament Greek um, 25th edition, I think, back then, something like that, 24, somewhere around in there. They compiled the Greek New Testament. Basically said that this, the first five books of the Bible, as written by Moses, were not actually written by Moses. They were a combination of myth, historical legend, and some written truths. Some. So he didn't believe that Moses got everything right either. Because people ask, well, if Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, how did Moses write about the creation when he wasn't there? And then how did Moses write about his own death when after he died, how could he write anything? And there are two possibilities to that that number one, God spoke the words to Moses and he wrote them down beforehand, which meant that Moses then would have had knowledge of when his death was going to occur, what was going to happen afterward, and so on. Or that someone, possibly Ezra, who was referred to as a ready scribe in the Lord, Ezra was a good guy, that he added in the details of Moses' death uh, by way, given by way of the Holy Spirit. There is uh, a quotation in the Gospels, and it says this was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah saying, and it was talking about the 30 pieces of silver being a goodly price. Well, when you look that up in your Bible, you won't find it in Jeremiah. I think you find it in Zephaniah. But the twist is, God didn't say that Jeremiah wrote it. He said that Jeremiah said it. And if Jeremiah said it, the Holy Ghost knew it and told whoever the gospel writer was, Write this down because I'm telling you, Jeremiah said it. I not only was there when he said it, I told him to say it. And he wrote it down. I don't believe in the book of Enoch. I don't believe that it's part of the scripture. I don't believe you, I, you can read it if you want to, but I wouldn't believe a word of it 
with the exception of the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, if you will look at Jude, Jude did not say, as it is written by Enoch, he said, as Enoch hath said, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. We know that Enoch said it, and we know that the Holy Ghost both gave Enoch the words to say and then remembered the words that Enoch said. And he remembered them for several thousand years until Jude was ready to write it down. And he said, oh, by the way, Jude, write this down. Enoch said these words, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So I don't believe that Enoch should be in your Bible. I've already, I've already gone through that myself. I, I wondered that myself. I examined it. I read the book of Enoch and I went, this book is weird. This is nuts. This does not match the scripture. And there are people online who are putting out videos saying, uh, you know, this, this book should have, ne this book has been kept secret all of these years. And you should read this. And there is a reason why they don't want this book discovered. And, and it's basically setting you up for a lie. There are messianic prophecies in the book of Enoch. And people like Rob Skiba, who's now passed on, made big deals about these messianic prophecies that supposedly Enoch prophesied concerning Christ. And... I believe that they're not prophesying of the Messiah. I believe they're prophesying of the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist. And I, I, I just don't think you ought to read those things. All right, now, let's get into John chapter 7, verse 1. But this is what we know God said. How do we know God said? God said he said it. It's good enough for me, amen? So, verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee... For he would not walk in jewelry. Jewelry. He would not walk among the Jews. In other words. Because the Jews sought to kill him. Keep that in mind. That the Jews, most of the Jews, for the most part, despised Jesus Hated him from the beginning, starting, starting with Herod. And going on from there, they hated Jesus. And they wanted nothing to do with him and they wanted to kill him because he was a threat to their power structure. He was a threat to their established religion. Remember, if a man is on one street corner selling the world's greatest hot dogs and everybody's buying them and then I'm across the street selling the world's better hot dogs but I'm giving them away for free the guy across the street is losing his income and he's losing his customers and he's going to do whatever he can do to destroy me because I'm destroying his livelihood. I'm destroying his power. I'm taking away uh, the money that he's making and he hates my guts. And he's going to try to do everything he can to get me off of that street corner because I'm taking what he's selling to everybody and I'm giving it away for free. And that's what's going on here. Because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, verse 2. Now, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. We're going to talk about that. The feast of tabernacles. Does anybody know what it was? Does anybody have any knowledge of the feast of tabernacles? What did it have to do with? What was it about? What did they, when did they celebrate it? What did, how did they celebrate it? It's interesting, I watched a, uh, watched a video the other day, a guy went into uh, a Brooklyn, New York, Hasidic Jewish neighborhood, and it's like he's on the planet Mars, because these Jews own that section of Brooklyn, and the guy was, there was a guy that was walking him through it, and he, he said, there's about 120,000 of us here in this area, 
And he said, practically everybody here knows everybody else here, and we know what bakery to go to, and we know what butcher shop to go to, and we know this and what. And it just happened to be the Feast of Tabernacles. And every one of those, even in the apartment buildings, every one of those Jews had built a little area out on their balcony that they would dwell in during the Feast of Tabernacles. They would eat out there, they would nap out there, they would, you know, do certain things out there, whatever. But every one of them, it was like some kind of thing that they could just, um, I don't know, like that, that um, deer blind that Matthew discovered how it opened one day in the back of the church van. Did you hear that story, Chris? Years ago, I went down preaching at a church in uh, Van Buren, Arkansas. And the pastor knew I liked to deer hunt. And on the day, we were set, packing up on a Saturday, after, Saturday afternoon. Me and Matthew, it was just me and Matthew. And the pastor handed me this, this pop-up deer blind in the bag and all ready to go. And I'm just going, thank you for this. I mean, I'm going, wow, I'm going to be hunting in comfort this year. So I'm in the front of the van driving home. We're, we're, we're just about a few miles this side of Marshfield, Missouri. I remember it well. Because all of a sudden I heard, oh, snap. <laughs> Matthew had pulled that deer blind out of that bag and it went, poof. <laughs> and all I can see is him going, no, he got it back in there. He, he figured out how to get it back in there. That's one of the best stories I've got on him. So anyway, but they've all, all those Jews had those tabernacles, those portable tabernacles. They still, they still do this every year. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, therefore. Now we're going to find out from the text that his brethren, and when it says his brethren, this is where us and the Catholic Church cut off and say, nope, you guys are dead wrong. Because they believe in Mary's perpetual virginity. That even though Joseph remained married to Mary, Joseph never laid a hand on her her whole life. She was Virgin Mary forever, still is to this day, and it's not possible that James could be the half-brother of Jesus Christ the way the Bible says he is. It's not possible according to them. And so I don't know how they deal with this. They must say, he must be talking about his family, his cousins, or whatever, but his own brethren, and we're not told how many brothers Jesus had, but we know that aside from James, or James may have been a disbeliever at this time, but they, they did not believe that he was the Messiah. And they're mocking him. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the, see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. And they were basically mocking him and provoking him and say, Well, Mr. Holier Than Thou... Why don't you, since you're so Messiah-like, why don't you go and be Messiah at the Feast of Tabernacles and bless the Feast of... Surely the Messiah is going to go to the Feast... And they're just... They're egging him on because they don't believe that he's the Son of God. They don't buy it. They don't, they don't recognize him that way. Or, or let's say... Jesus has not opened their eyes yet. And that's, listen to me, that's the key. And I want to say this to everybody listening to me. 
I don't care if it's your husband or your wife or your daughter, your son, your mom or your dad, your grandchildren, your aunt, your uncle, your cousins, people you work with, people you're married to, whoever. I don't care who it is. You're wanting them to be saved. You are begging God for them to be saved. You're praying day and night to be saved. Bottom line is, they will not be saved until God opens their eyes to it. It's as simple as that. No amount of religious ritualism like in the Catholic Church or in other churches can do that for anybody. It, it doesn't matter. And, and I remember, I'll never forget Buster Montgomery. God bless that man. I love him so much. He's, his wife was a good, faithful Baptist Christian. And Buster uh, Alva was his real name. World War II submarine veteran. And um, almost got blown up dozens of times. The ship, the submarine he was on, they, they went back to Pearl, unloaded his, his group, loaded on another group, helped them put on their supplies in there. That sub went out and never came back. That's how close he came to death. Many times he said, I'd lay in my bunk and just hear those, those Japanese mines going off and thinking, at any moment I'm fixing to die. Can you imagine that being 18 years old? He's 17 when he enlisted. He lied about his age. But anyway, Alva went to this church for several years. And when I would give testimony time, Alva Buster would stand up, just tears, very emotional man, tears in his eyes, say, I can't tell you how much I love this church. You people are the best people in the world. I just love you to death. And, and Pastor Mike, I just love to hear you preach. God, and, but he was lost. He was lost. And one day, 77 years old, he caught me going out the door and he said, uh, come over to my house this week, we'll drink some tea, I got some questions to ask you. I said, okay. So I went to his house and we talked about submarines and we talked about this and that and the other and he said, I, he said okay, here's what I want to talk to you about. How, how will I know if I'm going to heaven or not? Seven men, 77 years old, was a good man, but he knew he was a sinner. And he knew that all those years going to church did not make him saved. He knew that all of his good works did not make him saved. He knew that he wasn't getting any younger and he did not want to spend eternity in hell. And God opened that man's eyes and he got saved in his house that day and his wife bawling her eyes out. And the first thing he said when he got done praying the prayer, he said, okay, now, when's baptism day? I said, well, let's make it a, let me, give me, let me clean the spider webs out of the baptistry. We'll make it a week from Sunday. He said, let's do it. And I'll tell you what, that man, I've never seen anybody that happy to get saved. But God had to turn the, had to turn the light on for him. And with Jesus' brothers, same thing. Just, just because they were related to Jesus Christ himself did not make them saved. Verse 6. Then said Jesus unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Now, yes, you know, in a way the world does hate us, but they hate us because of who we are and who we believe in. And it's not really us that they hate. Jesus is telling us they hate me. And anywhere you show up, they hate you. They hate you. you and I've heard people give their testimony about every time they get around certain family members. Man, it, it, it's like they just turn loose World War III on them. Ripping them to shreds, trying to get them to, to laugh at dirty jokes, trying to get them to drink, trying to get them into sin, trying to show that they're really hypocrites, or just blasting Christianity, blasting religion blasting 
calling us hate mongers, homophobes, this and that and the other. They cannot, and it's not us. Don't take it personally. It's not you they hate. It is the Spirit of Christ dwelling you, and the Spirit that is in them is what hates you so bad. They have the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience in them, working in them and through them. And that's where that hate comes from. So Jesus said, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. I've come here to tell this world just how bad and evil is. That's why, the, that's why all the Sanhedrin hates my guts. That's why Herod hates my guts. That's why all the religious leaders of the Jews, that's why they hate me so much, is because I'm telling everybody how rotten and evil they are. I'm telling everybody, if you read Matthew chapter 23, which do that tonight, after, after you get home from church, read Matthew 23, you'll see Jesus open the eyes of the people around them and tell them about the religious leaders and how they're, they're, they're basically, their mouths are open sepulchers. That's why their breath stinks. Smells like dead people, amen? And that they've got rottenness on the inside. They're full of dead men's bones. They're just full of that. Who, I've got, boy, those pictures. Where are those pictures? Somebody gave me pictures of a trip they made to Rome. And they went in these Catholic church. And a lot of these Catholic church, especially in Italy... There's always the dead body of some saint laying there in a glass case. Am I right? And what do they do, Melissa? They go up there and kiss it. Kiss it, touch it, bow to it, adore it, venerate it, pray to it. Jesus said you're full of dead men's bones. He's exactly right. Full of dead men's bones. I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He said, verse 8, Go ye up unto this feast. Now watch this. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now, I posted, uh, I posted before church tonight. Did you see my post? What does the Feast of Tabernacles have to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ? Um, let me do this. On the first day of the seventh month, the Jews had what was called the Feast of Trumpets. Seven days of trumpets. How many trumpets are blown in the book of Revelation? Seven. How many trumpets did they blow on the seventh day marching around Jericho? Seven. On the tenth day of the seventh month, they have the Day of Atonement. And on that day, in the Old Covenant, that was when they would have the scapegoat, and they would have the, the sacrificial lamb, they would discharge the sins of Israel upon the scapegoat and he would take those sins out away from the body of Israel. They would take uh, the sacrificial lamb, take the blood and they would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat seven times to make an atonement for all of the sins of the children of Israel for one year. And the next year that had to be repeated. The next year after that, it had to be repeated. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats is not eternal. But the blood of Christ is, which makes it so that Christ doesn't have to die every time we sin. Christ doesn't have to die every time they hold the Mass. And the Mass kills Jesus all over again and it is an abomination but that's the day of atonement then on the 15th day of the seventh month they have the feast of tabernacles it's called Sukkoth or Sukkot 
And that comes from Genesis 33. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. And the Hebrew word Sukkoth means booths. In other words, he made little, little booths, little stalls for his animals to, to be pinned up in, to get, to get them out of the heat, get them out of the rain, a place where he could put uh, provender or feed in and give them water and they could live inside of that and not have to be out in the heat and not have to be out in the, in the rain or whatever, but he built that for his animals. And God said for the Feast of Tabernacles that everyone was to take palm branches was one of them. There was other things they could use, but palm branches sticks out in my mind. And I'll tell you why. Now, I'm, I'm going to go ahead, and, since we're, it's about a quarter till, I'm going to go ahead and give you my, my little theory. And some people share this, and, but you don't, have to, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. When Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, they were holding palm branches in their hands. But it wasn't, it wasn't tabernacles. It was just pass, it was a week before Passover. But the, the palm branches were what they used, like Gilligan's Island. All the huts on Gilligan's Island are made of palm branches, okay, palm fronds. So they were waving palm branches when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem a week before Passover. Now I always looked at that and said to myself, I think that has something to do with tabernacles. In Revelation chapter 7, and you can turn there if you want. That after we have sealed the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe, the 144,000, after they have been sealed with the seal of God in their forehead, then we look in verse 9 of Revelation 7, after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and what else? And palms in their hands. Okay? My wife said, well, of course they had palms in their hands. Everybody does. Yeah. Anyway. But they had palm branches in their hand. And, and why? Why? We don't have an answer to that. But my, my personal theory is that it has to do with the timing of the Lord's coming. So let me illustrate it like this, and I'll back up in my notes. You had three major feast days that every Jewish male was required to go to Jerusalem for. Who can name all three of them? I give you a free DVD. Feast of Passover. Feast of Pentecost of weeks. Feast of Tabernacles. Now watch this. The meaning of the Feast of Passover was for the forgiveness of sins which took place, its fulfillment took place, when? Passover. The meaning of the Feast of Weeks, it was called the Feast of Ingathering. And it's when the harvest was to be, you know, number 49 weeks. And on the 50th, or 49 days after after Passover and on the 50th day you had the feast of the gathering in of the wheat 
and the harvest. Okay? What's, what's God going to do in the rapture? Matthew 24, he shall send his angels and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven. The church begins on the day of Pentecost. God gathering together his saints. Okay? That was fulfilled at Passover. So we have one feast date not fulfilled by any significant event that centers around Christ. In other words, Christ, and this is why, it, let's go back now and look at what he said. Verse 8, go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet un, unto this feast. For my time is not yet full come. What does he seem to be saying there? That this feast of tabernacles is not the one. Okay? And he uses the word my time is not yet full come. And I have Revelation 10.6. You can turn there. Because I believe this mighty angel is, of course, Jesus. He has the rainbow over his head. That is the glory of the Lord. And God, God said, my glory will, not, will I not give to another. Jesus said in John 17, Father, uh, restore the glory which you and I had before the world was. Um, glorify me with the glory that we had before the world was. That's what he said in John 17. So the only person in, in that, that I can see who has the right to be blessed with the rainbow is Jesus Christ. He's the bow in, Revel in Genesis 9 that's in the cloud in the day of rain. He's the token of the covenant. He's the seven, seven lights that combined together make glory white, whiter than snow. Okay, um, so Revelation 10, 6, and swear by him that liveth for, and he's got a book open in his hand. That book prior was sealed with seven seals. Now it's in his hand open. Who cre and he swear by him that liveth forever, who created heaven and the things therein that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. In other words, now it's time. Time's up. Now everything that I said was going to happen is going to happen because he says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and I want you to notice that phrase, the seventh angel doesn't just sound in a minute. His sounding is in days. Does that make sense? In the days of the voice of the seventh angel. When he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, hold on to that, that phrase, the mystery of God should be finished. And let's go back to John 7. If you look up on the screen, remember what his brothers were saying? Verse 4, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret. And he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. In other words, they were trying to provoke him to reveal the mystery of who he, was, who he really was. To reveal the secret that had been kept all throughout the Old Testament. And now, in Revelation 10, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God now is going to be finished. That Everybody in the world then is going to know who Jesus is, including the Jews, including those that hate him, those who pierced him. Every eye is going to see him on that day. And they're all going to go, uh-oh. And we're going to go, oh yeah. So in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So everything that the prophets have said 
now all of the mysteries. Um, beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall re be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's the rapture there. And before that, you have the opening of the eyes of Israel. They're, gonna op they're, they're partially blinded, but they can't see the New Testament. They can't understand it. God's going to open that eye and they're going to be able to see the New Testament and they're going to believe it just like that. God's going to open their eyes, say, let there be light. They're going to know it. They're going to believe it instantaneously. Like, like today when God said, Mike, that Bible's right and you know it is. Boom, I believed it right then, right then. Not a doubt in my mind that, that Bible is right 100% it's right. And I still believe it's right to this day. Cannot be wrong. It's impossible for it to be wrong. So you see, you kind of see where I'm going with this. And I'm not a date setter, never have been. Well, I won't say never have been. The first few months after God called me into this thing, I went looking for the date, Chris. Day and the hour. I want to know that God, I want to know the day and the hour. I come up with a dozen of them. And finally, God said, Mike, cut that out. And what he was doing, he was, he was helping me. Mike, I'll show you things better than that. Oh, there's things better than that? Oh, sure there is. And boy, was he right. I, I couldn't care less when it is. I know it's coming. And I'll let God worry about it. So anyway, now, let's very quickly, we got a couple minutes Let's read this and then we'll get really deep into it next Wednesday. Leviticus 23. Let's look at tabernacles and what it is. Uh, first of all, the word tabernacle, believe it or not, is where the word tavern comes from. Tavern. Not that that's a week where we're all going to drink. But in days gone by, let's say in merry old England, you're traveling down a road and nightfall comes and you see a village off in the distance and you ride to the village and you see a building marked ye old tavern what do you know is going to be there room and board a bed nasty bed some bread a hot fire uh, some um, oh what is it that they make over there pork pie what else? Um, blood sausage. You get all that, all that good stuff. It, it is a temporary place to dwell. Temporary. Because you're only going to spend the night there. Okay? You're going to get a meal. You're going to get a place to sleep. You're going to get a place to put your horse up for the night. And then in the morning, you're going to get your horse. And after he's been fed and watered, and you're going to throw some coinage at them, a few pounds sterling, and then you're going to hit the road and continue on your journey. That's, so that's what a tavern was back in the day. We've changed that now. Nobody really spends the night. That, well, some, I guess, do. Yeah, on the floor. So anyway, that was in the days before Uber. Okay? So Leviticus 23, 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. 
On the first day shall be an holy convocation. That means he's going to bring everybody together. And you shall do no servile work therein. So the first day, whatever day that fell upon, whether it was Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday, it was a Sabbath. Okay? And so you shall do no... And that's the, that's the key right there on the Sabbath day. The key is no servile work. Now, do your, do your lambs and cattle, and your, does your cow still need to be milked on a Sabbath day? Yeah, because they'll be in the bag will burst if you don't milk them. So the, to me, the, the clue there, it's like when Jesus... Um, was quoting the Ten Commandments, and he said, do no murder. Well, he's telling you, some people say, God says don't kill, so you're out killing deer. You're, you're breaking the scripture. No. Well, there can't be capital punishment, because that, that's breaking the scripture. No. Murder is the taking of an innocent life. The capital punishment is the taking of a guilty life. There is a difference. And that goes all the way back to Genesis 9. God instituted that law before Moses ever was born. He instituted the law, if a man's blood is shed by man, shall that man's blood be taken. So, Servile work, no servile work therein. Don't go to work on that. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and on the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. Ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. So he's declaring now exactly what this is. It's a seventh day or a seven-day uh, feast. Uh, the eighth day is also included. It's a holy convocation again. Uh, and you offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You give the Lord an offering on that day. It also is a Sabbath day. So let's say it took place on a Tuesday. Tuesday would be a Sabbath day. Saturday would be a Sabbath day. And then, by the time you get to Monday, that's the seventh day, but then the next day, Tuesday, is another, it's the eighth day, it's another Sabbath day. So you can have three Sabbaths in that, in that one period, okay? So anyway, but that's what, that, that was what the Lord told them to do. And the idea of tabernacles, we'll get into this next Wednesday, is that basically it's God saying, this is when I will dwell with my people. I will be with my people. I love going to preach to other churches. This year, we've established a work in two new churches, uh, Faith Baptist in Eldon, Missouri. Brother Wayne Dinwiddie finally got to uh, preach at his church, and then uh, First Free Will Baptist Church, which I've been to before, but have not um, have not really preached to uh, Pastor er Ernie Emerl and his or Emler and his congregation. It's a different church than then when I was there about 15 years ago, um, and had a great time out there. But I like being back here at Bethel. I like dwelling with my people. Amen. And believe it or not, God's looking forward to that. Amen. He's looking forward to it. 